that there's really no part of the economy that doesn't potentially have an opportunity to be entered with the cannabis in one form or another, whether it's with the hemp plant, where for you know fibers, fuels, uh, all you know textiles, uh, you know extraction for it's the best part of, of protein. Um, if you want to go CBD from it, you know whatever, however you want to do it, all the way through to the single molecule type um, isolate that um, my fellow panelist here is is working with. I'm, I'm going to start off by. Uh, talking about a few slides that are very high level about the opportunity, about the business. And then each panelist has got a five minute presentation uh, talking about what each one of them do. Um, but you know, we, as I said, we've got a diverse panel. We've got a couple of bio guys, you know, scientist types. We've got you know, a tech entrepreneur like me who's now sort of in this space and has been in it for a while. We've got a fellow BU, uh, compatriot who comes from public health, and then we have an international media star from Chile. So, <laughs> so let, me, let me just start off by kind of framing you know, the conversation today. At a very high level, uh, a few slides. Number one, cannabis is slowly becoming a global opportunity. And here, when I talk about cannabis, I'm talking about legal. Uh, legalized cannabis is becoming uh, a global opportunity. Uh, even in countries where it's illegal, um, you know, uh, it, they're slowly getting decriminalized, uh, or if, even if they're, you know, if it's criminal, uh, the uh, criminal justice system is looking the other way. But it's interesting if you look at this, uh, it's basically North America. Europe, Western Europe, Australia, and Chile. And we've got some representation here from Chile. Um, I think we're going to see this map turning blue very rapidly. And part of it is you know, a lot of experimentation happening in, you know, in, in the country of entrepreneurs. This is our country in, in the United States. And you know, it's, it's even amazing to me to see over four years how the entrepreneurial spirit of this country has just erupted so many new companies. And of course, you know, penny stock and you know, all the usual things, the wildcatting stuff that happens when we start a new industry like the dot-com industry. It's almost that same feeling that's happening here. Um, there's uh, a lot of money being spent, and a lot of this money was already being spent, but it's moving from kind of the black market into you know, the taxable market. And uh, you know these these curves sort of look a lot like you know the curves I used to present when I was raising money for my dot com company, so <laughs> back in the nineties, yes. Zelda Horror member. So a lot of these curves have that same sort of look. They're not they're not you know for you guys out of the biotech world, you don't see these kind of yeah. kind of you know consumer uh, spending curves. But this is one of those industries where we're starting to see it. Um, and you know it's interesting. I happened to be uh, in Canada visiting my parents the uh, the weekend where uh, it became legal in Canada in uh, this summer, and uh, it, it was amazing to to watch it on the news. I mean, it was like Apple coming out with a new iPhone. <laughs> people lined up outside stores. All the online stores were crashing. And I guess we've got our mini version of it here in Massachusetts with the two stores <coughs> opening up in Western Mass. But you know, typical Massachusetts, the news in the newspaper was people complaining about the lines being too long. <laughs> Not the people who were in line, yeah. but the people who lived around there. Right. So um, they should be happy. Yeah. There's business happening. So in the US, uh, you know, close to 70% of the population is now um, you know, living in, in places where it's legal to, to consume cannabis. Um, in fact, at the last election, I guess three more states sort of moved into that yep. category. This doesn't reflect that. Um, so this is all happening really fast. It's, you know, it's happening fast when, you know, some of the politicians who are really against it are starting to, to flip. I, yeah. I, I thought, did, did Orrin Hatch recently tweeted something and it was, uh, yeah. and, and 
the funny thing it's about crazy. it is how everybody uses, you know, the tongue-in-cheek reefer madness stuff in, you know, all their communication. And I think Orrin Hatch some, said something about, um, uh, uh, I think he used the word high in his tweet. So you know things are changing when, you know, politicians like that are getting on the bandwagon. Um, Canada, of course, is the second country to legalize it nationally. Um, now, every province, you know, is creating its own versions just like, you know, we, we've done here. Um, but it's very thoughtful how they're doing about it and how Health Canada is regulating it and how they're allowing that market to grow. And you can see, you know, the just sort of massive growth of their public markets as a place to go raise money for these uh, companies. Um, you know, uh, Constellation Brands making investment in can I mean, just crazy what's going on. And that's what happens if, you know, you have smart regulation, you know, around new industries. Um, it's a big opportunity. It's just not about consumption. It is about, you know, all the picks and shovels that go alongside any consumer market. It's about science. It's about bio. It's about medicine. Um, you know, Ease, I think, is one of the companies we've invested in has just raised a ton of money, and they're kind of the Uber of, you know, delivery. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but maybe you can disagree. <laughs> this, I'm just parroting what I read. But, um, you know, it's, it's just like any new industry, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. So for all you entrepreneurs around here, you know, try to leave with an idea of what you're going to start with this great panel. Um, let's see. And in spite of the fact that uh, institutional investors essentially are sitting on the sidelines because you know, their, uh, of their limited partner agreements don't allow them to invest uh, in, you know, in, in a class one drug, effectively, um, there's still a lot of money flowing into this space. And it's flowing in through public markets. It's flowing in through angel investors. Um, and, and I think that's just going to accelerate, right, as, as we start seeing things like the Constellation investment and that exit. We're going to see more exits in the space, more money is going to flow in. Cannabis is a medicine, and we're going to be hearing a, a bit about that from, you know, a couple of the bio folks on the panel. Um, you know, there are uh, hundreds of cannabinoids, there's hundreds of, what are they called? Terpenoids. Terpenes. Terpenoids. Yeah. Terpenoids. Mm -hmm. Terpenes. Thank you. Um, and they all have different effect on, on the human mind. And you know, the science and the research behind this hasn't been allowed uh, by the federal government. But increasingly, you know, uh, people are starting to figure this out. We've got one panelist who's going to tell us all about the entire DNA, um, you know, of of the plant. So that, that's going to be really interesting. Um, research is starting to happen. There are publications that are starting to happen. Um, there are uh, uh, clinical trials that are starting to happen. You know, before coming here, I did a quick search in clinicaltrials.gov and just put in cannabis, and I got back 750 hits. So there's 750 something related to clinical trial going on. Um, you know, so it's it's it's. The research side of it is emerging, and um, you know, hopefully, you know, the federal government will will get on board here and allow this research to flourish. And uh, there are patents being filed, uh, so there's there's a gold rush happening right now around patent filings, um, and you know, you're 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 going to see uh, many more because you know people are going to use patents as a way to get a monopoly, especially if you're focusing on the medicine side of it. <coughs> so that's it for me. I'm now going to invite Simon to come up and give his presentation. I'm Simon Espinosa. I came from Chile. And uh, having the opportunity to share what has been a great experience for me in the cannabis industry, it's a great honor. So thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about digital content and the creation of new trends in the cannabis industry. But uh, before that, a little bit on me. I'm a journalist by profession. I've written a couple of books. One of them was cannabis related, and it got to be among the best-selling books in Chile in 2018. 
And I'm also the host of a couple of YouTube shows, cannabis-related YouTube shows. So that's what actually got me in the industry. And I'm a guide point consultant for uh, Latin America, now the cannabis industry as well, of course. So before we hit the, uh, a few insights on the Latin American cannabis industry, I'm just going to highlight the two that I think are the most important uh, investor-wise. So the first one would be the low prices on infrastructure and labor. And then the second one would be the very convenient uh, weather conditions that allows you to have like two crops a year without using a single LED light. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about these insights, you can just go on prohibitionpartners.com. I would encourage you to check their, their Latin American cannabis report. It's, it's a very uh, extensive. So why did I got involved in the cannabis industry? It's because I saw a gap between an empty space between brands, products, and services and the final consumer. This is due to several <coughs> factors, but being the most important, the restrictive marketing environment. So there's been a lot of uh, uh, social, uh, close uh, cannabis social media accounts. Uh, Google advertisement is not usually an option for us. And all the traditional marketing channels are also closed. So, um, sorry. What do we do? Uh, we created. Uh, how do we fill the gap? Uh, we created. A, we did a creative kind of hub. It's basically a mainstream media that generates digital content for all the players in the industry and allows them to engage and connect with their final consumer. Underneath that, we offer them a supply chain, a distribution supply chain, so we can get products from the uh, manufacturer to the store. And then, by gathering all the data, we've constructed two lines of businesses that are focused on uh, product development. Uh, one of them is called Fauna, uh, it's hand, uh, products handcrafted in Chile. And then the other one is Cow, which is a great value brand manufactured overseas. That's basically the hub. Um, so, why is it novel? Uh, I think it comes down to education. Uh, marketing as a sole tool does not go viral on the internet. Uh, you have to give something in return. Uh, and then also product differentiation based <coughs> on quality is not enough. So what is it that we're giving back? What is that something that we're, gi we're giving back? It's digital content uh, but based on comedy or humor. Why humor and why comedy? Because uh, cannabis consumption and humor were organically close, so we, we almost thought it was <laughs> uh, good to keep them together. So I'm going to go briefly through these slides. Uh, this is how we look on social media. That's Instagram, vertical content, doing uh, reviews, pro tips, uh, giveaways, and also kind of this related news in a fun way that actually engages the, the users and get them to share. Uh, this is YouTube. We do documentaries. I'm going to get on that very soon. Uh, product reviews, and then just playing comedy, uh, kind of this related all the time, giving uh, and then, uh, sorry, and this is our publishing and editorial events. So we physically meet our audience in certain spaces so that we can get that feedback as well. This is basically our main product line. So this is how it looks like. As you may see, we're trying to uh, get as far as possible from the uh, usual uh, stigma of the cannabis consumer. Uh, and then, what are the upgrades and opportunities that we see in this kind of business model? It's basically gathering data from every point of the chain of value allows us to start constructing a map of the Latin American cannabis consumer. Then, uh, creating solid trends. It's, it's guiding consumers to a wiser choice with information, education, and humor. And then, all of these merges. Uh, better decisions for us as a company where, uh, where we can create and launch and boost products into the industry, but these are data-driven products. So how do we see the future? I just like, I, I'm going to read this because I think it's important statements. Uh, our main focus is to generate a digital ecosystem where all players in the industry can interact and use as a resource to understand and engage this new commodity market. So I'm going to use as a case example, one of our biggest brands is called Peacemaker. Uh, it's, it's one of our best selling brands in uh, food grade silicone, uh, which is very interesting because before Peacemaker, there were no brands for smoking accessories in Latin America. And then after we created digital content for them, a huge store opened and now all the brands, all the products are there getting, uh, they, they have a pathway. 
And then as a second case example, I hope I'm not running late, mm. but I'm going to use uh, you guys. <laughs> Uh, what is it what we do? We create digital content and we uh, bring it in a fun way to our audience. So we're shooting a series of documentary. This is part of it. And we're going to bring this MIT conference that is very technical. Uh, it can be intricated for some of the audience. And we're going to bring it in a friendly way to our audience in Latin America. So it's going to get uh, very hundreds of thousands of views in the first two weeks probably. So that will be it. Thank you so much for your time. I have going to talk really, really fast and still try not to go over, but um, somebody don't feel badly stopping me because I talk a lot. Um, first of all, this was the slide where I figured how am I going to show my background, my education, my you know previous experience before getting into cannabis because at my age, obviously, I didn't start out in the cannabis industry. Um, so I, I came there from a, a very long uh, way to get there. Um, graduated at the University of North Texas. My background was in uh, politics, uh, international relations, sociology, and collective behavior. I studied how to understand how groups work, how groups make decisions, and how to look at uh, decisions they make uh, based upon the size of the groups and the types of information they have available to them. I used that information to run political campaigns, which is why it's kind of funny that I have Bill Clinton as the name of my um, microphone, because I actually did run Bill Clinton in 92 as part of it. I was part of his team in uh, Dallas, Texas back in those days. Uh, that's a very, very high burnout field, uh, politics, which I did. And I thought, well, that's not really for me. But I was really all about the data. And so I went back and I retrained and became a process engineer. And I went to work for Rational Software um, as a process engineer, uh, helping to really bring process to industries at that point you know, that didn't understand technology, didn't understand the digital world, collecting data. You know, people were using spreadsheets and you know, just short of using an abacus prior to that. And we were actually teaching them how to have content and depth of, of capability in their software uh, methodologies. Uh, when I, I left there and retired and thought, well, I'm done, I took one more position uh, with Safeway. I ran all the process engineering and methodology there and then thought, why am I working? I don't need to. I'm done in 2003. Um, because of uh, um, issues around loved ones and health issues and all, I started looking at the cannabis space and saying, well, I can do something about this. So as you saw on my first slide, I talked about solving the dosing conundrum. Everything that I've done in this industry, every company I've started, every investment, every patent we've filed, every clinical trial we have done has all been around solving the dosing conundrum. Because there's no way that this is going to be adopted by the medical community, the science community, by frightened parents, by frightened loved ones, unless we can show them that, yes, in fact, we understand how to use this medicine, how to dose it, and how to pick certain types of medicines and certain dosing levels for different diseases. So that's where I put my focus. Lots Lots of people out there going after the next vape pen, I could care less. I care, I care about figuring out this plant and how to use it to treat diseases. So you have to begin with lab tested medicine. No matter what you're making, it has to have that associated with it. Otherwise, it's a guessing game. You have no idea what's in it. The naming, there is no nomenclature around the naming. People name things after their girlfriend's cat. They lie. They say it's something else that they think is going to be a bigger seller. So the names mean nothing. So you have to be able to see bona fide. How have it connected in such a way where they can't put a bogus uh, test result with a medicine either. So all those systems have to be in place. Then you have to ask the, the patients questions. You have to be able to understand how they're using, what they're using, what their medical histories are. The same way that if you go to a specialist now, you go to a neurologist, you have a problem or any kind of doctor, they're going to hand you a clipboard or they're going to mail it to you ahead of time and say, remember to bring it with you, which people rarely do. And it's like 11, 12 pages of handwritten. Then you're going to sit there while people are you know, uh, transcribing this into a system. It probably is not digitized beyond just being put into a PDF or into a Word doc. And then that data or that information is then used by the medical professional 
to you know, figure out how to treat you. So what I did is I took a standard for a specialist, you know, found the best of the best, and then added a whole section on cannabis. What are the kind of questions that we need to understand about somebody so that we can understand as a starting point? The other thing is I'm all about looking for patterns. What do I want to ask so that I can find if there's anything there? If we don't ask the question, we won't know if the pattern. For example, when I was looking at asking about people's, uh, the veterans. Veterans obviously are a huge, huge audience market to focus on for uh, cannabinoid potential therapies. I needed to find out if they'd been exposed to any uh, chemical weapons, if they had been, when they had served, what area they'd served in, so I could see if other people with those same issues. It may not make anything different on how I treat them or how my doctors and nurses treat them, but over time, we might find patterns in those and that information. But if you don't ask the question, you can't find it. When I first started in this and I talked about collecting data, people thought I'd lost my mind because there was no such thing as collecting data around cannabis. And now you can't swing a cat without hitting somebody who's collecting data around cannabis, which is very, very exciting, by the way. I think there's plenty of room for everybody. The other, I'm just going to show you an example. Because of what we know from the data, we know the types of cannabinoids and terpenes that we're going to look for if we're looking at a cannabis medicine. You know, so when you have somebody who's starting to look at the products and looking at the labeling and looking at the lab results associated with it, you want to have these sort of these sort of of, of uh, components within the medicine in order to have to make a sleep medicine. They don't all have to be there, but you have to have some combination of them in there. And then a doctor can make or a, or a, a specialist can make a recommendation of a dosing protocol based upon the averages from the data you've collected and you figure out which are the cre you know, key criteria that are necessary and then you make the recommendation and then you find a product that works accordingly. But then you also have to get the patient feedback and it's very nice to see does it make you feel good but I want to see something like Lasky scales on cancer and pediatrics. I want to see um, MRIs. I want to see blood results. I want to see measurements of if you were only sleeping on average an hour and a half per night, three nights a week, and you were you know, napping during the day, how many nights are you sleeping now? I want to see something that we can quantify and figure out how it works so that we can repeat it and make sure we get the doses better and look for the patterns for the different people. So the other thing is you have to validate all this information. Once we have enough anecdotal information from people's experience from what they've reported, we then have to be able to, d to test it in a clinical trial. I don't have the results to show you right now in this slide deck because we're in phase two study right now in Australia on a, on a uh, sleep study that we're doing there on one of our sleep formulations. And this is, that just is one I'm mentioning uh, because it was easy for the presentation. But it's not certainly not my main focus. Um, but what actually what my main focus is is on cancer treatments and uh, the side effects of cancers and hopefully at the same time reducing the, the you know, as a secondary benefit reducing tumor size. Um, I've been a huge proponent of whole plant medicine from day one. I've always been about whole plant, full spectrum, you know, um, I'm sure there's a reason for isolates somewhere, um, but mo maybe for standardizing a full plant to, you know, to tweak it up to a higher level, but um, I wanted to prove it. So we funded a clinical trial, a preclinical, excuse me, in Spain, looking at the uh, entourage effect, in other words, the, the, the synergy that occurred between the various cannabinoids and terpenes that are resident within the plant, the whole plant medicine, versus the single compound, which is what the pharmaceutical model is built upon and previous studies that have been done in cannabis and all the clinical trials have been done on pure compounds of either THC, CBD, et cetera, but not on the whole plant. Just a couple examples of how it works better. Okay, I've been getting the high thing. So here are the companies that I started to figure it all out. So Aunt Zelda's is well understood medicine. We have been making formulations for years and years, treated thousands of patients with it. Calispring Wellness is the medical practice that we started. They are the ones that are collecting the data with the patients. The patients interact and all with the data on what they're using. Uh, CDR Med is the software platform itself that I built. Zelda Therapeutics is the company in Australia where we actually 
actually fund preclinical and clinical trials around the world. Um, the oil plant is my response to legalization in California. I saw a lot of companies were going to white labeling, and the more people that I spoke to, all I kept hearing was I'd ask them what their background was, and they all had marketing degrees. So you make really beautiful packaging, but what the hell's in the package? You know. So I decided maybe we should put make something that we can actually put a quality product into other people's packages. A Canadian company came called Gabriella's Kitchen that makes wellness products and wanted to do full spectrum across from good foods to good medicines, came calling and I said yes and we joined forces. We're doing the Alto brand for them. And that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm, I'm Jess Lieber. I'm a head of business development at Ginkgo Bioworks here in Boston. Uh, a long time ago, I was course five here at MIT, back when Building 20 was still on this site. And uh, in a very non-linear career path, I find myself now in the business development world, having been in the, the academic environment until quite recently. My background is a professor of microbiology at the University of Chicago. Uh, but now I am working to head up Ginkgo's business development efforts in uh, natural products and APIs. So today we're going to talk about something uh, very different from what you've been hearing so far. We're talking about doing away with the plant entirely to produce cultured cannabinoids using genetically modified organisms through fermentation. Um, so there is undoubtedly going to be a continuing demand for people who want whole flour. We just heard this from, from uh, Mara. Uh, but increasingly, there is going to be demand for purified, isolated cannabinoids, including the trace cannabinoids. When Vineet was having an introduction, he started listing some of the cannabinoids. I would say, you know, depending on your definition of what constitutes a cannabinoid, there could be upwards of 50 or 100 cannabinoids. But based on a certain chemical structure, I'd say there's roughly 10 to 20 of significant interest currently. So uh, what we're doing at Ginkgo um, is meeting this need. So the demand for pure cannabinoids is certainly increasing. Uh, not only are there pharmaceutical applications, there's uh, increasingly sophisticated consumers. Uh, and also a rational design of an entourage. You know, many of the plants now have been bred for high THC or CBD content. There is no rational reason to expect that they still have the ancestral uh, entourage portfolio of different cannabinoid molecules. So if you had in one hand uh, plant material and in the other hand you had isolated cannabinoids, you can mix and match a, a custom tailored entourage. So, Modern plant genetics has been fantastic. I think you know, there's plants now that have uh, 25 to 30 percent THC or CBD by dry cell weight, uh, by, dry, by dry plant matter. Uh, but some of these other very interesting cannabinoids are present um, at a percent, a fraction of a percent. And see, these are some of the cannabinoids of, of most significant interest currently. Um, very costly to separate. Their molecular structure is you know, only differed by a, perhaps a ring closure or a couple of carbons. And so uh, it can be nearly impossible to purify these in a cost-effective manner from an agricultural source. And, and some of them, I would argue that there's simply no cost-effective agricultural solution. You simply couldn't have enough cannabis sativa under cultivation to get THCV uh, or some of these other rare cannabinoids uh, at any appreciable uh, cost target. So uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, we're a, right, so these are our, uh, I'm not sure how well it's coming through and I had to scrub out the animation. These are our sc small scale fermenters. So we are a company that genetic, that engineers microbes for the production of specialty and fine chemicals. Uh, we had heard from uh, Simone about getting in two harvests a year. If you're going with a fermentation based route, you can have a, a harvest uh, approximately every four days. So, um, Ginkgo was founded by five scientists from MIT. Uh, shown here is uh, Professor Tom Knight. He was a tenured professor here in electrical engineering and computer science. Um, but he is also the founding figure of the uh, field of synthetic biology. And he had the epiphany in, say, the early to mid-1990s that the most interesting thing to program in the 21st century isn't going to be computers, it's biology. So Tom, along with four recent graduates from the MIT Biological Engineering Program, uh, left MIT and, and founded Ginkgo Bioworks in, in 2008. So underlying Ginkgo and everything I'm going to say today, and I think will resonate with this audience, um, I think it's inarguable at this point that DNA is digital code. You can read it, you can write it, you can program it, you can put it into production organisms, and you can make useful things with it. Uh, so many of the same engineering uh, concepts 
that were developed for writing computer code uh, and some of the standard operating procedures and a way of thinking about it as an engineering discipline are now being applied by Ginkgo Bioworks and a handful of other companies to metabolic engineering for the production of valuable things. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about Ginkgo. So again, 2008, um, we're somewhere north of 200 people now and a significant amount of automation, which is how we differentiate ourselves or one of the ways we differentiate ourselves in the field of, of custom metabolic engineering. So I think we have over 80 robots that are standardizing the process of, of engineering microbes. Um, we've just opened our fourth molecular foundry with BioWorks 5, 6, and 7 already under construction. Uh, over the past few years, we've been quite successful at, at raising money. We were the first life sciences company to come out of Y Combinator. Um, and I think in the last six years, we've raised uh, over $550 million to add to some of the early money. So we're, um, I, I should emphasize that what I'm going to talk about with cannabinoids is, is just one of over 50 projects we have underway. Ginkgo is not a cannabis company. We're not a cannabinoid company. Uh, many of our original projects were in the field of flavor and fragrance. It was a good technical fit. It was a good commercial fit. Very much like the cannabis industry, these were companies that were using agricultural extraction, say planting thousands of acres of rows in order to isolate individual molecules. Now we simply engineer yeast to produce those chemically identical molecules. So at, at Ginkgo, as I mentioned, uh, we approach biological engineering uh, as an engineering discipline. In the same way that chemistry uh, transitioned from chemistry to chemical engineering, uh, there are certain things you do differently when you're trying to systematize it and industrialize it. So uh, with our facilities at Ginkgo and having everything under one roof, we have very tight cycles of design, build, and test, as many of you are familiar with. But because we're dealing with microorganisms that need to be put into fermenters, we, we tack on fermentation at the end. Uh, I'm not going to go into these different aspects in any great detail. Design is the in silico work that's used to identify genetic diversity that can be harnessed to be put into our engineered microorganisms. Uh, build it develops the genetic tools to put this DNA into the, I think at this point we're at about 15 different microorganisms that we use for our industrial production, uh, many of which we have uh, built the genetic tools from the ground up to turn them into viable production hosts. Test, we analyze everything. You know, under one roof, we have genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, C13 fluxomics, so that when we engineer these organisms, there's no place left for carbon to hide, and we can transition, we can make sure that all of that carbon flows into our products. So um, what does it mean to engineer yeast as a, as a cellular factory for the production of cannabinoids? So the, the biosynthetic pathway for cannabinoids has been known for some time. As far as natural products go, it's actually not that complicated. Um, there's an upstream part where you're making the common precursor to THC, CBD, CBC. Uh, and then there's the downstream part where that common intermediate is cyclized to form many of the active cannabinoids. So, um, uh, many people are familiar with THC and CBD uh, and CBC. I'm not going to go into all the acronyms. There's kind of a parallel universe that you've heard a little bit about of cannabinoids that differ only by two carbons, the, the varinic variants, a uh, very significant interest. And if you're approaching this from a metabolic engineering standpoint, you simply swap out one part of the pathway with another, and suddenly you're producing this whole other constellation of interest in cannabinoids. So the general concept between meta behind metabolic engineering or organism engineering is you identify and optimize a biosynthetic pathway. In the case of natural products, many times that pathway is already known. You take those enzymes or similar enzymes, we'll get into that in a moment, and put them into a production organism of choice. Sometimes for a particular product, you use bacteria. Sometimes you use yeast. Sometimes if you're using yeast, you use Saccharomyces cerevisiae or Pichia pastoris or Euroia lipolitica. It all depends on what you're trying to make. And at Ginkgo, we always try to use the appropriate microorganism for a particular product. So you simply move those uh, genetic pathways into your organism, optimize it, and I'm making it sound simple. It takes roughly two to three years for a given project normally. Uh, and at the end of the day, you have a custom-built microorganism for the production of a single molecule. So in the case of cannabinoids, what we're doing is we're producing a, a range of microorganisms, each of which is producing a, a defined uh, cannabinoid at, at high purity and low cost. Uh, and any of these cannabinoids based on this common molecular structure are accessible, um, and we're currently producing or we're producing organisms to make eight of them, which I'll go into in a minute. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Just speed it up. Just about there. Thanks. Um, this is the pathway for making cannabinoids. 
Uh, the interesting thing, you don't even need the plant we talked about. You don't even need the enzymes from the plant. The idea of synthetic metagenomics is you can take the enzymes from any, from any kingdom of life, and arguably it's an even more effective route to producing these cannabinoids. So we're sourcing enzymes from fungi, from bacteria, from archaea, uh, from, from many different kingdoms, and generating an optimized pathway to produce these cannabinoids. Uh, this past summer, we uh, publicly announced our partnership with Canadian cannabis company Kronos uh, in the news lately um, uh, to produce eight cannabinoid molecules, uh, varinic and non-varinic variants. Um, they paid us a lot of money to do this. It's obviously a very lucrative field, so this is uh, currently valued at upwards of $120 million. There's a, a lot of money, obviously, in the cannabis field, and I think we're going to unlock a great deal of potential in this partnership. That's it. Um, Thanks very much. Thank you. I got my start actually here across the street uh, at the Whitehead Institute with Eric Lander. Uh, I was actually building this uh, robotic floor that tried to purify and did, in fact, purify about 500, uh, or about 40 million different E. coli clones to sequence the human genome. Uh, this is 96 to 2000. We took a lot of that technology and we rolled it into a startup called Agincourt Biosciences. This company was uh, eventually uh, sold to Beckman Coulter after it became profitable. Uh, and uh, much of the DNA purification technology you see in these robots is now used in the next generation sequencing market. Uh, but that wasn't really enough for us. We also built a DNA sequencer known as a solid sequencer that was in the marketplace for about five years competing with Illumina. Uh, very highly accurate but a short read sequencer. Bit of a VHS Betamax story there I can explain to you at, 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 over a beer. Um, but uh, a very fun sequencer. It, it got us involved in error correction codes and everything else. Uh, and then after that, uh, was, that was uh, purchased by ABI. ABI purchased that sequencer and, and uh, went to town with Illumina with that. And after about five or six years of playing around with that and some ion torrent technology, I decided to jump into the clinical space a little bit and try to deploy these sequencing tools to sequence uh, endocannabinoid genes because I had a sense that everything we were doing to sequence people's uh, tumors was fantastic, but every time we, we found a mutation in a tumor, we found a horrible drug to apply to it. Uh, and then, then we found these cannabinoids, and we're like, well, why is no one using these cannabinoids? These things are as non-toxic as possible. They're showing, they're shrinking tumors in many, in many papers, but no one's touching them. Uh, so we figured an important database to build was to sequence a lot of variants in, in thousands of patients in the ECS. And we published this paper on a variety of these variants in PLOS uh, that just showed uh, mutations in the cannabinoid 1 receptor and in Dagla and a few other genes in the ACS that are indicative of, uh, of different uh, disease states. Uh, that got us involved um, into dumping deeper into the cannabis field. Where the, the ACA came out and changed everyone's reimbursement for sequencing patients and we decided uh, the insurance companies don't believe in this cannabis stuff. They're never going to reimburse this. Let's just get out and start sequencing cannabis genomes. People actually believe in that. And in 2011, I sequenced one of the first cannabis genomes with an Illumina platform, and it was a disaster. It's the best we could do, but it was in hundreds of thousands of pieces. Uh, but it still gave us a reference to where we could sequence other cannabis genomes and compare them. Uh, and so we started going down that road uh, because even without a perfect genome, you can do what's known as marker-assisted selection in agricultural genomics. You can get enough markers in the genome to track particular traits and go through accelerated breeding to bring out traits like cannabigerol. In fact, that's one, uh, one, one platform we've done with one grower is we've gotten them to, uh, enabled to get 14% cannabigerol production. And we're now starting to see other people push THCV up to the 10% and higher levels by utilizing either Mendelian breeding uh, or accelerated breeding with marker-assisted selection. Uh, this has happened in the ag field before. If you look in the agricultural industry today, over 95% of the ag industry is using uh, marker-assisted selection to, to genetically enhance their products. They're not always GMOing them, but they're just accelerating the breeding, and cannabis is like at $1,000 a pound, uh, maybe $500 a pound, but they're using this technology on $4 a pound. Tools. So there's, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that people are going to use genomics to accelerate cannabis. It's just a question of how, where, and when. Um, but we also felt that um, we needed to get a transparent ledger. One of the problems we have in cannabis is it's all cartelized into different states. And every state gives a monopoly to one software company to run the tracking system. And inevitably it gets hacked and it breaks. So we sent in a, a grant to a, a cryptocurrency known as Dash to basically fund the sequencing of a better cannabis reference. Uh, and in doing so, we could probably build a seed to sale tracking system that would genetically fingerprint strains, uh, and we could utilize that to actually track the, the supply chain throughout the industry. So they funded this in June 3rd uh, through a cryptocurrency grant, and by August uh, 3rd, we had the, the most contiguous cannabis genome assembly ever created put public. 
Anyone can pull it down. You guys are welcome to use it at Ginkgo. There's a lot of cannabinoid genes in there. Um, and we've continued to add on that internally um, to, to, to actually push these N50s out to, right now they're, they're almost chromosomal in length with the other tools that we've applied. So this is a really interesting technique that you can use uh, with, uh, with cryptocurrencies, but the cryptocurrencies funding science is great, but we really want to use them as for the distributed ledger technologies because that is something that's more global than a cartelized MJ freeway or a state-by-state state C2Cell tracking system that invariably doesn't manage the entire globe. It just manages the needs for one particular state. We want to build something that's more global than that. So we have been using these blockchains to actually sequence cannabis genomes and hash them onto blockchains so that people have a, a date, a timestamp as to when it was created, and they can also utilize it for uh, offensive or defensive intellectual property, depending on their, 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 their use. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, there's a site up there called Canopedia, where there's probably about 1,000 different strains up there that have been sequenced. They've been hashed into blockchains. People are probably 80% of the customers are using this defensively to prove that their cannabis strains exist so they don't get usurped by a submarine patent. As people mentioned before, lots of cannabis patents are issuing right now. They're pretty broad. So a lot of growers are afraid they're going to get submarines, and they want to have proof that their strain existed at a particular time, and they utilize these sequencing tools to do this. The reason they're using blockchains is you can't go and get your cannabis plant notarized at a bank. I mean, you can try. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it's not going to end well for you. Unless you're in Canada, you can probably do it there. But in the United States, the notary system is pretty much run by the federal bank system, and they don't notarize cannabis. So what we do is we sequence it, we digitally notarize it, and then they have a timestamp people believe when it actually existed. Now, with that data and that barcode, you can figure out its homozygosity, its heterozygosity, what it's related to, and what to breed it with. Uh, and that's what we try to manage at the site called Canopedia. It, it, it's kind of a genetics linked in for a lot of the growers out there. They can, they can find people who have unique strains. If they want to cross it with someone who's got a TH, THCV strain or some rare cannabinoid, they can find them, co contact them, and maybe, uh, maybe make a cross happen. Now, the last thing we did, and I think I have enough time just to touch on this, is um, this cryptocurrency was very interested in also disrupting the publication market. Has anyone here been involved in peer review? OK, uh, it, this is like going to the dentist, right? Anyone like it? No one likes it, okay? It's got a horrible track record. It's about <clears throat> half the publications can't be reproduced. Uh, and this cryptocurrency recognized some of this is due to tracking information and incentivization. The, the, most of the peer review being done out there, there are, it's all done anonymously. You don't have people's names on it. And a few rare cases like F1000. So they figured out one of the reasons why peer review isn't working is that no one has an incentive to actually do it. It's all done for free. So why don't we pay people? Let's just experiment with this. Let's get review done quickly, and let's create a cryptocurrency system that actually pays reviewers to get shit done really quickly. Uh, and then maybe we can accelerate the whole scientific process, because this three to six month process of review stuff is actually is, is, is a huge impediment to scientific progress. So we set up a system where we did a review of this cannabis genome that we did. And I'll forward you to this website. There's a, there's a, a QR code you can, you can take a picture of and go to it. That's a peer review that's all been done peer to peer. No journal, no copyright, open source. You can download all the data, and the journals are cut out. Uh, we don't know if it's going to work. We encourage people to try and mutate it and, and, and take it uh, another direction. But it was fast. This all happened from June 3rd. The project was done August 3rd, and the reviews are already done and online. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very different way of doing things. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, the next speaker, which is Marion Knapp. So my name is Dr. Marion McNabb. I'm a public health doctor by training. Um, so um, as our, our moderator mentioned, I went to Boston University School of Public Health. Um, my background is in global sexual reproductive health and rights, actually, and HIV AIDS. Um, and I worked the latter part of my career on uh, digital technologies for health and designing national information systems around electronic health records. So Mara, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit more after this. Um, and building mobile applications. Um, and I found I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a cannabis entrepreneur based out of Massachusetts here. Uh, started my company two years ago. Um, we're called Cannabis Community Care and Research Network. And for the last two years, we've been very active um, in advocating for research and uh, better quality education around cannabis and Massachusetts specifically. Um, so who we are, we're currently now two years later, a uh, network of 2,000 academic industry, cannabis consumer patients and healthcare providers locally and expanding. Um, and so we, um, in my public health background, uh, one of the one of the one of the key uh, areas that I believe in cannabis is advancing research. Um, and so, you know, two years ago, uh, or in 2017, if you all are aware, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine published 
what would be the most latest up-to-date systematic literature review regarding the uh, scientific evidence around cannabis. And the research conclusions is what struck me and why I started my company, is that it has been extremely difficult to conduct studies due to regulatory hurdles, funding hurdles, um, and just supply issues uh, to conduct can medical cannabis studies in the United States. And so with that, in Massachusetts becoming legal two years ago, um, in, in a state that has over 100 institutions of higher education, we sought out to advocate for a state research license category. Um, and then we also decided to think about how can we creatively, um, in lieu of having a state sanctioned program and, and also importance of you know, the federal government and funding and international rigorous studies, we sought out to say, okay, well, how can we start to demonstrate, um, you know, do some science and, and research now? Um, and so we thought about what about citizen science? Um, has anybody in the audience heard the term citizen science before? All right, great. So citizen science um, generally is our projects that involve citizens. Um, and thinking of citizens as scientists themselves is born out of the basically agriculture um, and environmental health. It's a relatively um, new scientific field. Um, but you know, a lot of these projects um, you know, is definitely considered a research methodology like any other, uh, comes with different challenges. But one of the cornerstones is opening data and open, open source and open science data. Um, and making data publicly available. So earlier this year, uh, my company uh, partnered with UMass Dartmouth and three local registered medical dispensaries in Massachusetts to try and uh, conduct a citizen science study uh, with the idea, it's an anonymous survey, it's 71 questions, with the idea of when a person you know, gives information to a researcher, they should be able to receive that information back immediately uh, to be able to make their own individual and community level change. So we set out, um, and uh, within three months, um, we had several different data collection channels. It's an online survey, um, and so we did a national uh, Qualtrics panel, but then we also partnered with these three local dispensaries uh, to really uh, you know, have um, the local patients uh, fill out the survey and to be able to do patient events um, at the dispensaries where we could discuss local information. So within three months, we um, you know, collected about 2,000 uh, responses and 868 in Massachusetts. Specifically in Massachusetts, I will not be presenting all of the data. You can go to our website and find, uh, find a lot of these findings, and we'll be uh, submitting our peer-reviewed publication this weekend. Um, but about half of our respondents um, you know, were a good gender profile, about half or below $50,000 uh, a year annual income. And the, you know, what we are interested in looking at, it's a consumer and patient survey. We're really interested in understanding why locally people are using cannabis at the dispensary. Um, is that, and what are key findings, and these are consistent with other studies of reasons of medical report, chronic pain, anxiety, and depression were the top reasons. And then we started to really try and understand, are there differences in, in regional, you know, in these different dispensaries of uh, patients seeking uh, medical cannabis, and then if those dispensaries are offering the correct products um, for their patient populations. One of the most striking findings that we have found is that um, over 50% of Massachusetts residents are actively using cannabis to reduce the prescription medication intake, anywhere from uh, uh, opioids, antidepressants, uh, benzos, muscle relaxants. And as we started to realize this, um, it's a very important factor when people are trying to substitute uh, medications for medications when many healthcare providers here locally are not uh, trained in cannabinoid medicine and can't oversee it leaves a patient to manage uh, their health care on their own. And we are in a very large opioid epidemic in Massachusetts. Uh, since 2000, there's been a 350% increase in deaths here related to opioids, and five people die a day. So for cannabis, um, it's coming out recent in the literature that you know, in states with medical cannabis laws, there's decrease in, in opioid deaths and hospitalizations. There's more and more publications coming out about the public health impact, the clinical impact, and how cannabis can be used um, in these situations. And so is it time maybe for Massachusetts to consider that cannabis might be an alternative therapy? Um, there are rationales and, and clinical guidelines available. There's, you know, other countries are implementing this as uh, treatment options. So additionally in our study, we've also found that cannabis is uh, showing to help people reduce the use of alcohol and tobacco and other harmful substances. So understanding that cannabis can be a harm reduction strategy or prevention strategy is something that 
that we're learning through this work. So back to our open citizen science, as I said, if you're um, filling out the survey, uh, you see your results against everybody else's immediately. Um, and we also ask if uh, respondents are willing to share their information for other researchers to use to continue to publish. We, we are trying to break, break the bonds of the researchers and have, have access to information and data. 91% of the people said that they would be willing to have their data shared for future research. 21% uh, are interested in sharing their story and 58% are interested in continuing in future research studies. So these are our partners. Um, we are taking this information down and developing uh, specific uh, education materials at these dispensaries, trying to use data as a way to generate community conversation and build free educational resources for patients who are trying to manage uh, medication substitution um, and the stigma around medical cannabis use. So what's very exciting in Massachusetts is one, there's a research license category here. There's currently four uh, applications pending to uh, be a research facility, which is fantastic. Um, and so the CCC, the Cannabis Control Commission, has also ad adopted an open data policy. So they will, um, you know, they've engaged an open data provider and are really interested in um, moving towards democratizing access to information around cannabis that's been locked up for so long. And then also, uh, Massachusetts is obviously a, a going to be a big leader and, and a lot of focus on uh, cultivation and energy and um, sustainability and those kinds of issues. It's very unique here in terms of uh, power and consumption. So C3RN is, is currently working with other partners to expand our health work into uh, more of the cultivation side to try and understand that and open, open access to data. Um, and so you can, uh, we've launched our virtual Cannabis Center of Excellence uh, this last month. And uh, this is a space where you can go in and find uh, networking resources. We'll have a lot of educational content, access to data and information at various levels to help businesses, also patients and consumers. Thank you. Let me, let me repeat the question because it has to go to the microphone. So opportunities not what you're working on. Anybody want to take a stab? The media guy's got to take a stab. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I would uh, encourage people to compete uh, and get them into our fields. It's always better to have competition. I think any entrepreneur that actually wants to be uh, the best in their field would like that to come. Uh, beyond that, I see lots of opportunities in, in every single aspect because it's an, it's an uncharted territory, right? We're all, I mean, every, every one of us in there's different disciplines. I'm, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but, but I, I've gotten as close as possible to like all the other fields and they're currently developing. You know, this is, uh, the, the story is yet to be told, so um, I would see a lot of opportunities, especially in, in, especially in countries that have not yet legalized or not yet make the first move towards regulation, I would see there the opportunity to do basically anything of what we've already talked about. So um, another, another way to answer this question, you were there when the internet started, right? There was a company here called Open Market. Anybody remember? They had the best technology for a lot of things, search engines. And in the end, um, they bet on the wrong thing. They bet on e-commerce, and it wasn't time for e-commerce. So there is no answer. The answer is you gotta take the first step in something and see where it goes. I'd like to uh, take a stab at that. I gave a presentation a couple of times, one in Latin America, I think I did it in Colombia. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> one of them. And then one also I did, uh, I was the keynote speaker for YPO, and those people are all looking for opportunity. They wanna look to where they're gonna put their money. And what I did is I did a deep dive into all of the different um, uh, opportunities in touching the plant, and then all the opportunities in the not touching the plant in the cannabis space, um, because of you know various laws and also people's stomach for um, you know working with a Schedule One, for example, in this country and in most countries you have barriers. And what I found was that there's really no part of the economy that doesn't potentially have an opportunity to be entered with the cannabis in one form or another, whether it's with the hemp plant, where for you know, fibers, fuels, uh, all, you know, 
textiles, uh, you know, extraction for it's the best part of, of protein. Um, if you want to go CBD from it, you know, whatever. However you want to do it, all the way through to the single molecule type um, isolate that um, my fellow panelist here is, is working with. So, or if you want, if you're an attorney and you want to be in this field, if you're a doctor and you want to be in this field, it doesn't matter. It's like whatever you already know how to do, you probably can do it in this it's space. It's applicable. Yeah. It probably will have an application right. somewhere within this space. Awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in two. And two. we need them to come. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And, yes. and we need them. Out. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's one area that I, I'd add on is that there's a tremendous interest, and I. You know, this might be a short-lived window because I think it's a little bit political and the science is not leaning in its favor, but when there is a large scare about driving under the influence. Mm -hmm. If you actually look at the literature driving under the influence, it's actually a much safer drug to be driving under than alcohol, but you know, there's still fear. Um, all of the people trying to solve that problem are doing it wrong. They're trying mm -hmm. to look at blood chemistry. You right. can't get this problem done with blood chemistry. You, have to get cognitive, cognitive you need some type of iPhone right. cognitive test on the side of the road to really great, figure out the Great company in Edmonton that's doing that. Too. Yeah, so there, there, there's a window right there. Um, yeah. Every other agricultural field doesn't use clones. They use seeds. You've got to figure out how to get stabilized seeds. Uh, that's something that there's a variety of ideas out there on how to do it. Could be five years out, but the people who are starting it now will probably have a really healthy business figuring out how to stabilize seeds. Hi, uh, George Hightower, uh, Stock and Beans is my local company. A question for the gentleman from uh, Ginkgo. Two part question. First of all, what's the valuation of your company? And can you please give a pretty specific and detailed um, differentiation from what t is doing? Sure, that's a, okay. Um, hmm. I believe uh, that the valuation that was talked about in the press, I'm not going to give you a specific number, but it's, it's north of a billion dollars as of our last fundraising round. Uh, Tiwanot is taking a very different approach for the production of cannabinoids. They are starting with chemically synthesized THC, uh, excuse me, CBGA, um, and then using in vitro enzymology to convert that common precursor to any of the final uh, downstream targets which by, I think, every reasonable calculation is not going to get you towards the, the final dollar a gram cost targets that people are really interested in. It just doesn't scale. Is that concise? And what do you, um, how would you compare the number or variety of cannabinoids you have versus what they have? So the question is about the number of cannabinoids. Yeah, so I, I know that the t not technology, what they do is they use enzymes to make that, turn that intermediate into the final molecules, and their, their primary discovery was that by varying the reactor conditions, primarily the pH, you could change that cyclization pattern. Um, I don't know how many they're, they're going after. Um, I, I would say, you know, it's probably 10 or fewer uh, with the, a handful of being of primary interest. Uh, with our collaboration with Kronos, it's publicly announced that our initial targets include eight cannabinoids, uh, but in theory, we could go after a, a larger number. Thank you. Earl. Back there. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chad Girl. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, my question is, has to do with the uh, endocannabinoid system, so we've discussed a lot about cannabinoids and uh, even terpenes, but um, utilizing the ECS, how can you deliver new methodologies or new medicines through it, um, and what's unique about it compared to traditional methodologies? I'll take a little bit of a stab, if that's yeah. all right. I mean, I'm sure my colleagues will have a different viewpoint. I'm not answering that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, up until now, it's been a bit of a cart and horse problem. And you know, federal regulations aside, it simply hasn't been possible to do the well-controlled clinical studies you would want with certain indications on one hand and uh, pharmaceutical-grade chemicals on the other. Um, it's hard enough even getting high-purity THC and CBD. But now with these interesting trace cannabinoids, uh, there was never a supply previously to allow you to understand what kind of effect does THCV have on a particular cancer or other indication. So I would say those data are certainly coming out now uh, from a variety of, of approaches, but it's, it's very early exciting days for that work. I'll, I'll throw in there in that um, there's two different forks here in the road, and they're both going to probably have market share. There's the FDA route that you see with GW. Uh, ironically, Kronos probably has a higher market cap than GW uh, because there's probably going to be a flower and maybe even a synthetic cannabinoid approach that takes uh, a different path here. Uh, so whether this is going to be considered nutraceutical or pharmaceutical grade, I think is still undecided. I think both are going to persist for a very long time. Uh, and the other thing I throw in there is I think a lot of the clinical trials in cannabinoids have been 
challenged by the fact that if you dig into the placebo effect, it's all governed by the endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to run placebo controlled trials, you, you really have to rethink them because the ECS is what's governing the placebo effect. Right. So there, there's some challenges, like if you look at the trials in pain, they're not working out. You've talked to anyone who's in the pain market and the opiate numbers are obvious it works. But they're not making it through trials because of this. So I, I think there's, uh, we may have to take different approaches in evaluating, like, like what you're doing, measuring what patients are actually experiencing. These, these observational studies, if you do them on grand scales on social media, you have more power than yep. a 10,000 person clinical trial. Yep. Yep. And we Absolutely. Have to keep that in That's the mind. point. Absolutely. So one of the thing, one of the things that we've been doing is, you know, this is kind of a little bit opposite of the way most science and most, uh, uh, drugs or treatments would come into the market because you have a little bit of science where we know how to do a lot of things with mice and in petri dishes mm -hmm. but not very much in humans but we have humans that are taking this information and applying it on their own through social activism through just you know anecdotal people making it in their backyards people are making it in their garages people coming to organizations like ours that are a little bit more you know sophisticated than that and we know where the receptors are in the endocannabinoid system, where they're located. We have a pretty good idea of how they uh, respond. We know, for example, that there'll be a lot more receptors where you have a tumor and with things like that. So we know what to target. And we know pretty well, okay, this activates the receptor. This is an antagonist. This doesn't, this, you know, whatever. We know enough to take some pretty good uh, guesses at it. So. Uh, as far as whether it is an FDA, a pharmaceutical, or whether you do the biopharmaceutical, which is the route that I prefer, which by the way, you can also go FDA with biopharmaceutical, it's just a different route, um, then you can continue to make products and, and make things to help and treat different diseases without having every bit of science because nobody's ever died from it. So there's, you know, there's nothing that you, all you might do is you know, break out into a pizza box, but you're not gonna really have anything <laughs> you know, dangerous occur if you make a wrong step with this, which is one of the, it's the safest thing to work with. Can we, next question here. Here, here, back there, and then you. This is for Simon. Um, what is the cost of production for a pound or a kilo in, in Chile? And what is the, uh, what's the average selling price for, for the same product? The second question is, what percentage is extracts in terms of sales, and what percentage is flowers or uh, all right, so it's a really good question. It's uh, the first, we need to uh, all get, so that we all get in the same pitch. It's a uh, regulation that's not allowed dispensaries to sell uh, pounds or grams of wheat. So the only reference comes from the black market, which is basically 14, um, I would say like, uh, what's the translation for that in pesos? Sorry, but about uh, yeah, $14 uh, a gram. So I, I'm not really good translating gram, grams into ounces, but so um, they just and there's the plenty of people here that can do that. Right? I'm, yeah, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, having said that, there there's still people that's getting out there, and and there is dispensaries in Chile, based on the concept of jurisprudence, because there was a lot, the Supreme Court uh, failed in favor of a woman that was treating uh, her daughter with uh, cannabis. cannabis. Uh, so there is a, like a very young construction of uh, dispensaries. So the price is expected to, to go a, a little bit lower, not as low as Uruguay, for example, which has a totally different system. So it's not, it's not a regional thing in terms of South America. So it's, it's expected to cost around $10 a gram. So it, it should drop, the, the price should drop a little bit on the transition. And sorry, what was your second question? The second question is how much how much is the actual plant? Yeah. Uh, All right, so there's only three companies that I'm aware of that are selling extracts. One of them is Fundacion Daya. I would encourage you to look for that because they're doing a great job down there. And they're selling uh, uh, RSO through uh, uh, NOP Laboratories. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the name. It's, a, it's, it's been around for a long time. But 80 years. And they develop a lot of different uh, pharma, pharma, uh, pharmaceutical products. So. Um, and then after, beyond that, there's also Tilray got in the country. So they're selling e extracts or derivated cannabis products, but there is no like uh, BHO in the market, not, not legal yet. You know, there's like people generating in and selling it, but it's all black market still. That is expected to be regulated during the next three years, uh, according to our uh, 
the crystal ball. <laughs> Your price is about sixty seven hundred a pound. I wouldn't know because I don't know pound yeah, sterling, well, but, yeah, but, but if, let's, if, let's if you think it is, yeah. keep, keep that analysis it to yourself. Work that Next way. question. <laughs> Next yeah. question yeah. Uh, directed yeah. to Jess Lieb or anyone else knows the answer to this is the those rare cannabinoids or very low quantities, like for example CBN. What is the going price for a pure gram of those materials? I don't think that market exists. I don't think it's you know. You, where would you project that to be? For yeah, I can project. I can Who's buying I, that. I, I would estimate that if you wanted one of those trace cannabinoids, where would it be at a gram right now? Um, I would say you are looking in the five hundred to a thousand dollars a gram. Would you? Would anyone want to also pine on that? I've seen stuff what lower than a couple cents a milligram. Yeah. So. Uh, on CBD, but CBN, you, you wouldn't do this way. Yeah, so, yeah CBN yeah, one, isn't yeah, a rare you, cannabinoid. You just, right. you, just, yeah. you just you oxidize so, THC yeah. to get it. So I yeah. think like 97% pure THC, lowest possible price is around like $7 a gram, um, and I would multiply that by about 100 for some of the trace ones. We're, we're seeing some of the grows in Canada putting public numbers out as a couple dollars a gram. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, there's lines and they're, they're out of stock, so I don't know if the numbers are going to stay. Right, right, right. Uh, and that, that's for flour. That's for flour, yes, that's I'm sorry. For, that's yeah. for flour, and flour is usually 20%. So it, it's. But it's, you bypass a lot of the, uh, let's say, purification type procedures that you need from one. Of course, one. yeah, that, this, is, that, this is very true. Yeah, yeah we're, very true. Our, our publicly announced target is a dollar a gram. In okay. Colombia right pure. now, you can pure, buy. Yeah, that's a very important point. In Colombia right now, you can buy extract at about uh, five dollars a gram of extract, and it's pretty high. It's pretty high concentration. This is an important detail that you are asking, uh, and there's a difference in price of production in Canada and price at storefront. A lot of that has to do how much you have to fractionate the material as you go to storefront. If right. you can't sell. QP storefront, it's going to be much more expensive, right? right? Yeah, for sure. So, so you you, you know there's a market happening when it sounds like commodity traders. Sure. Yes. <laughs> so, so we've got another question from a man with, with a tie. No, I, the next question's got to come from a woman. I see a hand there. All right, you're next. The man with the tie. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is a question more oriented towards the um, the American panelists. Although I'd appreciate uh, oh, the gentleman uh, no input worries. from the gentleman. It's in because the I didn't bring a tie. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have no this yeah. Um, <laughs> So I'm an attorney, and I think in terms of dumb attorney questions. But how do you fundraise? I, I realize that the gentleman in genomics referenced a blockchain grant. Um, but how do you fundraise? In, um, the United, in the United States? What's the vehicle by which you <sighs> get money to do <laughs> these things? Okay, I'll take this one. Uh, you, yeah, can't right. ba you can't bank. Yeah. All right. Well, all first of all, I sit on the board of a bank. <laughs> <laughs> I am the first cannabis company owner in the United States to actually sit on the board of a bank. <laughs> Um, and when they asked me to do it, I was in shock. I thought it was a setup from the feds. Yeah. <laughs> but as it turned out, I'm actually on the website, so I guess it's real. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so yeah, so there is, you know, some of these barriers are coming down. They're coming down quietly. They're coming down because banks and credit unions are putting their toe in and going to people like me that squeak and, you know, everything is nice and clean and there's no, you know, jail in my past, you know, and all those sorts of things, you know, and, and plus the fact that if, you know, I have books going all the way back, so all those kinds of things. But I've raised money quite a few times um, all over the world, including in the United States. Um, most of my money, I have to admit, has come from overseas. But now I'm getting knocks on my door on a daily basis from family offices that are trying to invest in this. And that's, that was shocking to me, is how many family offices are looking to get into this space. They're finally, they're seeing these you know, Constellation brands and they're seeing some of these things and they're like, we've been sitting on the back burner and now we're looking to jump on board and get, and get some of this big money. Um, there's a group out of Illinois right now that's in nine states that's valued well over a billion dollars and they're raising money from, uh, for as far as I know, all their money's coming from the U.S. Um, there's quite a few of them. And what the, the, 
The challenge is that's been for me looking at this industry all these years and being in it for quite a, some time now is at the beginning, you know, I like to say that the, you know, the plant sits in the middle with concentric circles going around it and all the money was arm's length with nothing that actually touched the plant. Yep. Right. And it was like, you know, vaporizers or the material or grow lights or fertilizers or whatever. Picks and shovels. DNA right. Picks and shovels. That's, that's, Picks and, yeah. yeah. And it's kind of gone further and further in and what's now you're seeing this mad rush of people having these ridiculous valuations in my opinion <laughs> ridiculous valuations Come on, you were you were part of that company right <laughs> right 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 but on um, things like um, uh, cultivation I mean that that's a race to the bottom it's gonna be the same price as tomatoes here pretty quickly so if all the companies I have and all the things I've done we buy we don't we don't grow nor do I have any interest in ever growing. Um, I love to work with the, you know, the cultivators and the geneticists and all that, and you know, good for them. Let them live and be well, but I'm not putting my money there because that's, that's going to be a bottom dropping out very quickly. But you do see more and more people that are saying, I better jump in now or I'm going to miss it. They're not going to miss it, but they think they are. So it's that whole uh, fear of missing out that people have right now, and they are putting their money in, and the key is to have them put it into serious science and the serious things that have an opportunity to really make a difference in the world, whether it's on uh, environmental issues or whether it's on the health of products, etc. instead of it being just on the quick money, get in and get out, and then leave uh, so a mess FOMO, in it. So FOMO, but not farms. Right. <laughs> and these guys got to put the farms out of business, right? <laughs> we'll compliment the farms. Question. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, um, my name is Kate. I've been working in the cannabis industry in Mass for the last five years in a variety of capacities in dispensaries. Um, so in my role previously, I worked as a clinician. So I'm curious to hear from a lot of you wonderful people what your opinion is on moving towards standardization with dosing. Um, I work with thousands of patients, uh, primarily educating them on what to do, and it's a large guessing game, and typically we try to set realistic expectations and work with them to try to find a range. But honestly, uh, how do we go towards figuring out these dosing for these patients for certain conditions without moving towards a system that's based off personalized endocannabinoid systems? So before you answer that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You should, yeah. I'd like our primary end, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I guess you actually go, are, go ahead. Would be go much ahead. better on dosing. Yeah, that's um, right. You know, I, I, no, but go ahead. You have a perspective. You've done patient surveys. Right. Right. People are taking it for chronic pain. All right. What, what, have you asked them a question of you know how much they're taking? Yes. Yeah, we do okay. have that information, and we do have information on how much they're consuming by condition and what they're preferring. And I think you know, to your point, Kate, it is extremely difficult. This is personalized medicine. Um, and it is very different for um, people who are either taking other medications, you know, if they're taking, if they have other underlying diseases, if they have anxiety on top of cancer, you know, then you're trying to treat two types of conditions because we ask about symptoms um, and about underlying, underlying condition. So I think, you know, it is, it's about personalized medicine and it's about um, trial and error, but I'm going to hand it over to her because she, that was her talk. <laughs> <laughs> She's she okay. Well, you know, um, I'm, I'm researching it. I don't know how much I know. I know what I don't know. But um, uh, first of all, we always follow the edict of <clears throat> Ethan Russo of start low and go slow. I mean, there's this, you know, you start out somebody to really, you know, if, if you color your hair, they say do a skin patch test to see if you have an allergy. So it should be the same thing with any cannabis medicine you take. You start out with a very, very, very small amount, whether it be, in some cases, we start people out with a third of a milligram of THC. Standardize something at 10 milligrams per milliliter, you're going to have about 30 drops, so each drop's going to be about a third of a milligram. So you can know and you can count that way. So um, I'm going to tell you how we titrate people to get to their dose. The, it's a myth that cannabis is different in the sense of that it's bespoke medicine because all medicine is bespoke medicine. You know, anyone who's ever been on a on a any kind of a SSRI or a hormone or anything else, how many different ones they had to give you before they got one that worked for you, and then then how long did it take to them to get to a dose? The difference is because the endocannabinoid system is involved in so many things. It depends on your hydration, how tired you are, how much fat's in your system, whether you've eaten or not. All those things you know, will affect how the medicine affects you on any given day. 
But what I always tell people to do is the way we titrate them is we, we start having them go up very, very slowly. When they reach a level that, where they feel the psychoactivity, if they're using a THC, for example, we then have them stop until they don't feel it anymore. Then we have them increase again and keep doing that and stopping until you don't feel it. Once you reach a level where you can no longer acclimate to it, back off one level to where the last time that you could, and that's probably your therapeutic dose. You do not have to feel uncomfortable and disassociative to use cannabis as your medicine. If you're feeling psychoactivity to an uncomfortable degree, you're probably taking too much. Now, once they reach that level, you have to do some sort of third-party verification whether to validate whether it's actually working in treating the diseases and not just making them feel better. And based upon that, you may have to, in you know, a few weeks, you may have to start once again to try and titrate again. Also, uh, of course, I'm not a specialist, but uh, I know a lot of people that are. And uh, you might want to Google Dr. Dustin Sulak. Many of you know him. Right. He's, He's an expert in doses. The, Healer.com or something like that. Yeah, he's he he. Yeah, he's he's part on, of your stuff. He sits right on my board. He's awesome. I interview yeah. him, and then he knows a lot about dosing on cannabis. I, I can share one story with you with, that was in, in somewhat part of that that publication that we put out. Which we, we sequenced about 330 children that were in the GW study, primarily to look at not just those ECS genes, but the P450 <clears throat> genes. Uh, the, the cytochrome P450 system is the, the, the enzymes in your liver that metabolize the cannabinoids. And I think the one thing we learned from the complexity of that work is that you want to avoid the liver if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of those kids in epilepsy are on three other drugs, and the drug-drug interaction matrix is so complicated that you really can't even predict how they're going to perform off of the SNPs. I think one study came out of that, out of MGH, that showed the kids with clobazam were getting like tenfold higher rates of endus methylclobazam, which is actually the active form of the drug. And those were kids that were on both CBD, or I should say epidiolics, and, and clobazam. Uh, so there is clearly something going on with the liver, and the liver makes uh, a shotgun effect, like three other cannabinoids come out of it, and if you're taking a spectrum of different cannabinoids, I'm sure there's many more of them, uh, that these things that go oral mucosally or the things that go through transdermally through the skin, they're much easier to get the dose right because right. you're bypassing the complexity of the liver. Correct. Do you feel that it's the liver and not the stomach? It's a good point. It could be both. There's been a few papers suggesting the, stu the stomach can convert uh, cannabinoids. I don't think there's a holding up right now. Um, there's uh, the, the few folks that were pushing those papers were selling transdermal patches. Mm -hmm. I still like transdermal patches. But uh, a lot of the chemistry work implies that was an artifact of their, their um, mimicked stomach environment having a soap in it, like, like uh, an SDS, which mm -hmm. basically formed micelles and did different chemistry than what you might find in the stomach. Excellent. Question here? Hi, yeah. My, my name's Peter. My background is electrical engineering, now database. And this is my background, too. Going on toward data science. Uh, one of the questions I have is, you know, my head is spinning a bit with all the information I've uh, gathered from, uh, well, you know, all of you on the panel. Great information. But I'm just thinking, gee, the next job I take, do I have to get a drug test again? What's the kind of uh, corporate acceptance or, you know, is my only choice for my yeah. next yeah. job if I partake of the now legal can cannabis uh, products yeah, in the cannabis some, industry? Some, some career advice. Yeah. Public yeah. health. Yeah, I can, I've written papers about that here. Um, yeah, no, I think uh, if you, like, the, Actually, currently in our study, um, less than 20% of people are actually worried about that, worried about getting tested. Um, if you have, a, if you have like a driver's license category or operate physical machinery or that kind of stuff, you know, generally you're going to be tested for cannabis. But I think in Ma are you Massachusetts locally? Uh, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> there's some precedent. Um, there's been some court cases of people that have had medical cards and that have been fired. And so there is protections for you if you are a medical patient. Um, but it depends on the employer. And if you're employed by multi-state. I'm getting a new job. Yeah. Can I expect that they'll be tested? Um, I think you know it depends on companies, and maybe Kate may have another idea, but it depends on which company it is, if you're a multi-state company or if you're whatever, but regulation-wise. I would say the numbers in your favor. If 58% yeah. of the state is starting to use it, they're going to be hire anybody. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and if you have a medical card, that's going to be a much different situation than if you're a recreational user. Same for life insurance. Yeah. Interesting. Question back here. Um, with regards to the work going on over at Ginkgo's, um, how exactly are you engineering your hosts? Are you using like heterologous expression to, if you will, cut and paste that genetic material 
into a industrialized host, or are you building the genetic or the um, biosynthetic machinery from the ground up, like residue by residue? Sure. Um, so we are using well understood industrial hosts. Let's call it a, an industrialized yeast. Uh, certainly heterologous expression. For each of those biochemical steps, we, we screen through thousands of enzyme variants. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I hate to use the analogy, but it's apt. It ends up being a Frankenstein's monster at the end. <laughs> you know, it can contain DNA from 10 different source species at the end. Um, yeah, and they sometimes they go in one at a time. Sometimes they go in en masse. It's, uh, yeah. I guess the other part to that question is, um, how does that correlate as far as, is it better or worse than like traditional farming as far as production wise? And, and why would that be better than arriving at those molecules through just traditional synthesis and using like medicinal chemistry to make analogs? Right, so I can't really talk about medicinal chemistry to make analogs, but, but uh, you know, nature is, they're the best biochemists, they're the best chemists in the world, right? Um, and these plants, uh, despite human breeding, you know, they're not optimized for the lowest possible cost of goods. That's just not, I mean, they're, they're producing these cannabinoids for their own purposes and we're intervening and increasing it. Um, I, from my understanding, like the best possible agricultural economics would be uh, in Colombia, outdoor, equatorial, and at that, under those conditions, you can start to approach the low digit uh, dollars per gram, two, three dollars per gram. I, I'm obviously biased, uh, but I think when you're looking at the ability of industrial fermentation, you know, even a dollar a gram that we're targeting is not a very aggressive target. We have plenty of other targets of more, compli you know, more complicated pathways. We are talking $30 a gram. So Excuse me, point, point zero three, or 0.03 cents a gram. So you don't see, you know, toxicity to the cells as they increase production upwards of like, you know, 100 megs, 1,000 megs per liter or what have you? That's, that's a challenge that requires a clever solution. Um, that happens in many of our products. I mean, that's not really toxicity, I think. Some of the intermediates, olivatolic acid, definitely toxicity, hexanoic acid, some toxicity. Uh, it's more a question of the, the, the molecules going into membranes, so you have to engineer secretion. So in, ter in terms of the medicinal chemistry, um, some of these cannabinoids form racemic mixtures that are hard to separate. Enzymes tend to make them all left-handed or right-handed, depending on, on how you've done that. And the cannabinoids are pretty simple. They're a single exon gene, about 1,600 bases long. Uh, so it's not like a terpene where you have to worry about intron exon splicing and figuring out how to put the whole thing back together and get it expressed right. They're, I mean, I, they almost look as if they're bacterial in origin. They're, they're, they're very interesting. Awesome. Question. I guess this is kind of going off uh, what he asked, but are you able to synthesize THC, these other compounds, with the same level of quality, focus, and end result as uh, advanced precise cultivation methods? And I guess kind of going off that, do you eventually see uh, things like tissue culture and other uh, advanced solutions around other stages of the photosynthetic process becoming obsolete um, through the advancement of these um, technologies that you're working on? Boy, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, um, I'll start. I don't mean to monopolize the answer to that one. Um, but so let's uh, first part. Purity, I think, uh, with an engineered microorganism and subsequent downstream processing, attaining 95, 97% purity is not that tricky, especially if your engineered organism is producing one molecule. Uh, in terms of photosynthesis and making that obsolete, boy, that's a whole different can of worms. Um, having come from a biofuels background as well, um, I, I would say that there is, uh, it's a huge challenge to increase photosynthetic efficiency. Um, whether or not it really makes sense to be spending any effort engineering cannabis sativa to be uh, more photosynthetically efficient, I would argue almost certainly not. Uh, I would also argue at these price points, and it's a very valuable molecule, there's no point in using, say, a photosynthetic organism, as some people are doing, microalgae for the production of cannabinoids. It's a lot easier just to spend, you know, 40 cents a kilogram for sugar to put into your tanks than to worry about getting cheap carbon from the sun and CO2. Question back there, but I need that microphone to go back there. So while the microphone's going back there, I used a moderator's prerogative to ask a quick question. Um, medicine, recreation, or both? Lightning round. Everything. If you don't have recreation, you'll end up medical. It's all the same, it's just on a spectrum. Definitely need them both. Yeah, for sure. Easy. Question. Okay. <laughs> I have the microphone. Um, Kevin, this is for you. You talked a lot about using blockchain. What are some of your biggest concerns about the use of blockchain, and why specifically did you use Dash? 
Okay, so um, my biggest concern over blockchains are that ICOs poisoned the entire space and made it a scam space. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and so I, I think it's beautiful technology for distributed ledgers, but in the last year has seen nothing but shysters move in and, and, and contaminate the field. And you're not seeing a lot of adoption in the cannabis industry because, frankly, the valuations in the cannabis industry are much better than those in the blockchain space. So if you attach blockchain to a cannabis company, you actually lose valuation, unlike you might from a, uh, an IT company, right? So it's not necessarily going to change your valuation by playing with it. Um, uh, the reason we chose Dash is that Dash has a distributed autonomous organization that can fund things. They have a system that allows uh, the masternode owners to vote on how to spend 10% of the treasury that gets minted every month. Uh, and their treasury was, was somewhat around 8 or $10 million in January last year. Every month they're doling out in grants. Uh, the other thing about Dash is they have a cryptocurrency that could actually work point of sale. Bitcoin will never work in a dispensary. I'm sorry, it's $10 transaction times. The average transaction is 100 bucks. No one's going to go a zero confirmation transaction in a dispensary point of sale on Bitcoin. Uh, Dash can do that in a couple seconds, and so it can compete with PayPal and Visa, and, and they can actually play point of sale role. And if you're going to build a seed to sale tracking system, if you have a blockchain that doesn't actually get to point of sale, you don't have a solution. Uh, so we, we, ch we chose one that looked like it had the best stability and had the best characteristics that would fit the cannabis field. Thank you. Excellent. Another question? Listen, there's going to be plenty of time to talk to these people. There's a social event. Amy, upstairs? Upstairs. Fourth floor. Fourth floor. Elevators on both sides. Elevators on both sides <laughs> of the room. Um, OK, I get to ask the last question. So um, yeah, you guys are going to hate me for asking this question. But we've got um, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, California, Massachusetts, Chile, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have to ask this question. I mean, Massachusetts, I love being in Massachusetts because we can have these kind of conversations. Are these kind of conversations happening in Chile or in California? Where you put scientists. Want to go first? Just, the, just the fact that all of you agreed it should be both recreational and medicinal. Is that the same conversations as are happening in your place and your place? Yeah. I wouldn't say that it's the same conversation as in the uh, level of technicity has uh, its way higher in the places that have been already uh, made uh, a move towards regulation, even though it's not federally legal. Uh, but there is, uh, yeah, but I, I, I would say that there is something that, uh, that holds us together, whether it's like something more like activist or political that goes in the same direction. Uh, I, I believe that. All, every single one of us has like a previous relation with the plant most of the time. So we all would uh, like aim for the same thing. So I think it is a conversation that is happening all the time uh, or in, in, in many different levels. But the fact that I'm here, it's uh, actually to bring this conversation down there. So ah, good, we're, good, we're missing good. some gaps yet. Pretty so good. that's, yeah. yeah. That's great. So, um, I would say, I mean, though I'm in California, uh, Simone mentioned Foundation Daya. I'm on their board, for example. We did a joint venture with them on uh, growing. So, I mean, through an Australian company of mine. So we're doing all those things. But, for example, for this, um, I gave a talk a couple of months ago at Stanford to a group of 43 Merck scientists that they brought over and they were doing a week at Stanford. And they brought me in and somebody who's a data analyst from BDS Analytics, somebody who's an investor, you know, another science, and we all spent a grueling evening listening to them say yes, but, yes, but to everything we said. <laughs> but the reality, you know, in other words, no. But the reality was um, these conversations are going on. I think that Massachusetts has, um, because you have so many different um, institutions of higher learning here with such, you know, strong academic values and backgrounds and everything else, you have a real opportunity to lead the way on, you know, academia. I know that Pennsylvania wants to be the center of it, but I don't think that they can hold a candle to what you guys can do here in Mass. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Matt, All right. So, it's, it's interesting you mentioned pharma. We have every pharma and biotech around us, but yes. I never see them in mm -hmm. these uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. By your, no. it's, <laughs> yeah. they, they, it's I, I will say that uh, I've been to a variety of the cannabis conferences, and you'd be surprised how many of them have cannabinoid 2 agonist pipelines. 
Oh, uh, is so that it's right. going on. Yeah. It's yeah. going in, and they're just probably not as public and open about it. Right. Uh, and I, I would also iterate on this false dichotomy of, of medical versus recreation. It's like we, we have been talking about preventative medicine for 30 years, and we're not doing it, and this is the safest therapeutic index compound we have in our hands. Why wouldn't you start here? Right. Right. Preventative medicine is, gonna, is what's going to save the healthcare industry, and we have a tool right now that can start it. Right. Well, in, in, in addition to that, like since uh, medical trials are the only vehicle to uh, get through the market in Latin America, uh, the only players are big pharma so far. So right. it's kind of an interesting well, buyer, right. of course. It's well, the reason <laughs> that, I, that I joined with Gabriella's Kitchen or Gabby in Canada now is because it's better for you foods. It's you know, go preventative at the, at the very beginning, you know, give people good food and so you don't have to give them medicine to counteract the problems that they occur from that. But in, people get sick anyway, they can do everything right and still get sick, so let's have those medicines ready. For, I look at it like, if you think of a supermarket, you have your food aisles that have to have better for you foods, you then can go, you have a problem, you go and you buy something that's over the counter, and then if you really go sick, get sick, you go to the pharmacy inside the store. And so cannabis has the ability to play all the way across that supply chain. So speaking of food, food upstairs. You got plenty of time to talk right. to these people one on one. Right. We'll see you guys upstairs.